Okay, this is going to be a little interactive, so I'll make sure to use the mic since they're recording it. But I have a strong voice anyway. <laughs> um, so the goal is, is for this to be more than just a talk, even though I will present some stuff, I want to do some interactive stuff. And so at any point, feel free to interrupt me as well as we, as we go through this. Okay. So I'm going to talk about, as was mentioned, being agile architecture, about architecture, whatever that means, right? <laughs> and, and hopefully we'll come to a, a common understanding of how we look at it. I'll at least share my experiences on that. And, and I, I do want to point out that, let me get this in the right phase here. Okay. Um, I, this, this is based upon some collaborative work I've done with some colleagues of mine. I'm actually a, uh, a consultant. I have the, a company called The Refactory. I've been doing this for 20 some years. And uh, I've worked out in industry a lot, but uh, I collaborate with a lot of different people and we've been writing some best practices. And, and so uh, I've been working with it, at, most, most recently Eduardo Guerra from Brazil with some things on this. And so I wanna start off by first talking about, so this is like, being agile about architecture or agile architecture practices is another way you can think about it is if, if your company is agile and, uh, and, and, and as you're trying to apply good architectural principles, how can those fit together? Because a lot of times, I, I just attended a, a panel right before and one of the things I, I heard about by the person, the yogi that introduced me was about the fact that, you know, that architects are dead, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, or in a sense, the death of architecture coming up. And, and so how do these two ideas fit together? How can we still be agile and still have architecture? And you're always gonna have architecture. In fact, I'm probably best known, which is scary, for the most successful architecture deployed to date. Uh, even today, it's still proven that most architectures aren't that good. And I, I wrote a paper 20 years ago now, in two, 1998, hard to believe, a long time ago, with my colleague Brian Foote called the big ball of mud architecture. And it's not that we were proposing that, we were talking about that that was the reality, why so many successful systems end up that way, and if we look at it and admit the fact, maybe we can deal with it better and make our code more habitable and our systems and our architectures more habitable as we evolve. And we were never promoting that, and it was not an anti-pattern, it was like, there's good reasons why this happens, and if we, it's just like as a chef, cooks in a kitchen, sometimes things become dirty. But if you let it get too out of hand, too much technical debt, it can become a nightmare. So let me just ask a question. I want to do a quick poll from you guys so I have a better understanding from where you're coming at is, uh, how many people in here is, it's their role in their, wh where they're working as architect? The majority of people, okay. Not everybody, but the majority of people, okay. And, okay. I think I know, okay, I got a feel on this next question. Uh, how many of you are doing agile? Say okay, everybody kind of, so, so, so when you say you're doing agile, what, what do you do, for example? What do you, what do you, what do you mean by agile, for example? Uh, we implement a scrum system and. Scrum? Yeah, we in implement a scrum system and work with the product delivery uh, organization to uh, work on the product backlog. And I don't think this is on, but. Uh, yeah, so two week sprints, two week sprints uh, with uh, scrum ceremonies such as our planning and reviews, and and your refinement, yep, a sprint goal, yep. Other people here doing scrum? A couple. Who's not doing scrum but they're agile, doing something different? Uh, I'd like to hear what you're doing. <laughs> They give it the nickname Agile, but what they do instead, it's, I would call it a hybrid, and it's delivering pieces of functionality, but it's uh, most Agile projects, which I've been on, have Scrum Masters, and they recommend the two-week sprints. Sometimes they don't recommend the two-week sprints. They recommend two-month, two-month, three month, three month sprints. <laughs> and they don't do the, the waiting uh, like you normally see with, uh, with uh, typical Agile uh, projects. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else has any other variations they'd like to share? Kanban, okay, Kanban. Yeah, and so well, one thing I've noticed is, and in fact, sometimes you get scrum butt. I'm doing scrum butt. <laughs> uh, we needed to do a one month sprint, or we needed, you know, kind of like what was shared back there, or I'm doing, or a scrum bond, that's another one. You know, in Agile, 
Agile was never a process. It, originally, when the Agile Manifesto came out in Snowbird, Utah, when you know they got together in 2000 and they put together, it was really, we have so-called Agile practices, but I've known people doing Scrum that are not very Agile at all. In fact, I was just at a conference last week in, in Douro Valley in Portugal uh, where we're writing Scrum patterns. It was, I was with Copeland and some other people and they were putting together a book of some of the best practices trying to get back to the heart of Scrum what it was about, but Scrum itself doesn't make you Agile. It's a, it's a process of practices that you can use, and Agile, I really like what Linda Rising talks about, it being the Agile mindset, a way of thinking. But from a business perspective, Agile, Lean, or whatever, there's many out there, as we even heard. I know people doing mob programming, for example, even. Maybe you're practicing TDD or whatever type practices. But ultimately, you're trying to get, you have some concept, you have some roadmap, we have a vision, we're trying to break it down into sprints, we're getting feedback, let's, let's occasionally, not every sprint we necessarily release, but maybe we can if it's good enough, and if it adds value to the business. So we're really focused on that. Ultimately, the business view is to get it to cash, right? <laughs> get back to where it pays back for the investment that you're going on. But there's many practices with this. But unfortunately, I go to a lot of the Agile conferences as well, and one of my complaints with a lot of the Agile conferences, especially some of the big ones, is a lot of times people are telling you, well, if you do Scrum exactly like this, then you're being Agile. Which is almost, to me, very rigid. Like, I have to be religious and follow it exactly this way. And Agile was meant, was doing what adds value, inspect and adapt, learn, constantly retrospect, continuous improvement was a key part of that. So there's a lot of Agile lean miss when you get out there. And in fact, I put uh, this domain together with my colleague, Rebecca Wurstbrock, where we're trying to capture some of the myths, and I'm sure there's a lot more than what we have, and we're encouraging people to give us more feedback. But for example, you see something like, oh, you can always adapt to a new requirement quickly if you're doing Agile or Scrum. Because we have the two-week sprints, something new comes along, we can quickly adapt. Simple solutions always work best. Sometimes, things you're doing are very hard, and the simple solution is not the best. Oh, if we're doing Scrum, TDD, or ever, we'll get good design and good architecture. It'll magically emerge. We'll just do uh, some refactoring and keep, keep applying that and get good people. We'll have all these uh, uh, people that do the full technical stack or T-shaped people or whatever, which I love to have those people, but my experience being a consultant that works out there for different companies is on the average, average companies get average programmer Joes or average people, right? Uh, and so it's, it's hard to get in an organization all the people like that. You, sometimes if you can get a few of those good people and have them take on good leadership roles and mentor people, that can help. But it just doesn't magically happen. Some software qualities and architectural decisions are important to not put off to the last response possible moment, whatever that means. And you can always go fast. And don't worry about security. We know it's important, but wait until a few weeks before you release. And I've worked on a system that was like that. I was in a research environment, and Caterpillar Inc. was funding my research, and all of a sudden, the, it was the financial modeling system. And boy, all of a sudden, I got the, the ears of all the top, you know, CTO and all the other people. They were excited. They say, we want to put it in production. But it had to deal with money, so all of a sudden, security became important. Well, I was in the research environment. I wasn't worried about security. I had to refactor that system. Had I known that originally, it would have really influenced different decisions that I made. So it was very difficult, and it can have a tendency to create a ball of mud, very messed up system. If, if, if I had known, I could have made better decisions earlier on as part of that. Not overanalyze, but there might have been more responsible moments when I could do these types of things. So what I'm going to go through here is I want to spend a little bit of time. See, I claim that values drive practices. What you value, you do. So for example, I have a friend of mine who's he's a master chef. Uh, he's recently moved to Cyprus, but he used to live where I lived at because his kids were there, but now they're in college and he went to be with his parents who's getting old in Cyprus. But it was fun to go over. As this master chef, one thing that he constantly do since he valued good cooking things is he always experimented tried new things. And it was fun to be invited over for a meal at his house because I knew I was going to eat good. And, watch, and I watched him. You know, and, and as he would work, 
uh, in his kitchen. He would constantly be making a mess, but he'd be constantly cleaning up as he went too. And he had good practices. And, and he, since he valued certain things, it drove the practices of what he did. And there's my friend Rebecca Wurstbrock, who some of this work I've done with. She values good health and she's running marathons. So she, I remember when we were traveling, doing a lot of work together, she would still get up every day as she's preparing for a marathon and practice. Um, and my other friend, Richard Gabriel, a uh, musician, he practices playing music a lot. So depending on what you value, so if you value uh, good design, good architecture, clean code, then it will change your practices. And a lot of, uh, so when Agile, what do we have values for? And a lot of times, people get lulled into, it's almost taking the Kool-Aid with Agile, ooh, we can go fast, and early on we do, is we can deliver quickly and look at, and we can do just a lot of things. Sometimes going fast isn't always best. When you're running a marathon, you don't sprint the whole way. You, you'll get burned out and you'll fall apart. You won't finish the race. Um, and and I, we can go really fast to a ball of mud. So it's, it's kind of key, what do we value? Now, obviously, early on, a lot of the Agilists talked about the good feedback, the transparency, trust. Uh, we're focused on the, the customer. That's good. Uh, communication. But there's some other things, like continuous improvement and building quality software, because building quality software can help us sustain our development. If we're not building quality in as we go, we may be fast for a while, but then we hit a brick wall. We're being real fast, but we're being real fast at putting out fires and just trying to churn code out that doesn't necessarily add value to our business. So how do we stay focused on that? Whoops, sorry about that. There's an extra button here. And then keep learning and lots of testing. That was one thing I was real happy about with, with the Agile uh, movement when it came out in the late 90s and early 2000s and when they really pushed it is this, it, we're all responsible. We all take certain responsibility for the architecture and testing and validation. It's not like an us and them. We're all working together. We're on the team together. It's a collaborative effort with this. And there's a lot of good principles that we get with it. Mostly I like good people, but you also have technical ex excellence. Um, a good friend of mine who just passed away recently, Mike Beadle, who was real involved, uh, he was a signature on the Agile Manifesto, he, he's done a lot with in Enterprise, Scrum, other types of things. He, he, he was the first, uh, second adopter of Scrum behind Jeff Sutherland. He was, uh, wrote the first papers on Scrum, uh, the pattern papers, and then you know, many books and stuff. He had, he had a, a quote off of one of his social network groups shortly before he passed away, but he talks about no agile mindset, framework, practice, or whatever will cure incompetence, that technical excellence is a must. So it's not like, oh, let's just get, let's just get you the right coaches and the right people and the feel-good, warm fuzzies, which is good to have, but we still need good people and we need good technical skills. And, and so we still need a lot of diligence and hard work and we need to learn but we still need to have, pay attention to quality or, or we're gonna end up with a ball of mud. Now, one thing I, I've, I've noticed a lot here during this conference is a lot of people are talking about the fast changing. Rebecca yesterday talked about evolutionary architecture. And you know, anymore, I mean, the way the, the landscape is constantly changing. Oh, should my company, originally we made good architectural decisions five or 10 years ago. You know, we were able to scale up, but now we started to hit, hit the wall. We, we're having trouble keeping with it. We're having a good problem, it's growth, but how can we really handle that continued growth? We can't see how to make it through the next year with our current architecture. So do we need to go to the cloud? You know, maybe we need big data. Uh, you know, our teams are growing. Maybe microservices can help us, but we want to make sure to handle that right. And so how do we even keep up with all this? And so how do we balance this how do we balance staying agile and lean moving forward and still end up with a sustainable architecture? Um, a couple of months ago, I gave a talk in Brazil I was at, with a uh, it was sponsored by a company I'm working with, and they've had huge growth over the past few years and just had an IPO in this January, very successful. And a few years ago, they had zero microservices and a couple million lines of monolith architecture and it was starting to slow them down and they went from 20 some scrum teams to 80 some agile teams 
whatever that means, right? And, and now they have more than twice as much code in microservices than they do in the monolith. And so some of their architectural decisions help them continue to grow and be somewhat agile, but they have to balance that. If they're not careful, they're going to end up with a lot of microliths, and, and they'll have a distributed system problem that could be far worse than the monolith problem they had before. So architectural decisions can really influence how agile a business can be. Unfortunately, most business people don't understand that well, and uh, 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 even a lot of people out there working in the Agile community, they're, they're blinded to it because they're caught up with just the practices side, which Agile was never suppo it's supposed to be a mindset. Let's do what works best with the people we have that adds value, and let's constantly learn. Musicians are always practicing and experimenting with new things. Ooh, well, this sucked, this sucked. Oh, that was cool. Let's, cut, let's put it together. And, and uh, so that's stuff that we need to be doing but unfortunately, people are just worried about doing, let's get the velocity higher, higher, higher. And pretty soon, well, you're going fast, but you're not adding value. And we're not, we don't have time to breathe, experiment, and take a chance. And, and that's what's key. So what I want to do is, at the beginning of this, just right before, I just want to take a couple minutes break so I don't go too fast, give you a chance to breathe, is if everybody could just write down, yeah, one or two and I got a lot of pens here too, in case people need. If you could just write down one or two architectural problems that that that, that, you, that you've uh, that that you've uh, ran into in the past few years, it could be in the last year. It could have been a couple years ago. What were some challenges? And just take a minute or two, just to write down a couple. And then we'll look back at them later after I show you some patterns and we'll see how maybe some of this might work. So let's just take, I'll time box it. We'll make it just be two minutes, okay? Just a couple challenges or problems that you had over the last year or two with architecture. Okay. So by the way, I did something that is considered in general pretty important in Agile is to time box things. So we can come back and if we need to add more time later or do things then you do that but it's important to time box things that's uh, from from one of the agile practices it's done so so and we'll come back to this later so uh, i just wanted to kind of start with this and, and i'll come back to that so i want to present some patterns and i want to talk about you know for example what may, what is a pattern i'll give you a little bit of that but i have some patterns for being agile about architecture that i've written with a few colleagues of mine and the, the, call, the two main people I've worked with is Rebecca Wurzrock and Eduardo Guerra. And, uh, uh, and this is based upon our experience working with different companies as well as talking to a lot of people like you guys that have many experiences and getting good war stories. What works, what doesn't work, and let's try to capture that and document that. And so I'm going to share our beginning of a pattern language with you, and you may even have other patterns you can add to that as we go. Um, but I, I really want to make, what, you know, this, what is a pattern? What makes a practice a pattern? And generally what people talk about, repeatable, it's more than one, and there's, there's trade-offs. Any interesting designs we do isn't just always do it this way. Sometimes there's cost with making this decision versus another. That's what makes our architectures interesting. And so when you think of a pattern, a lot of times, and I come from the patterns community, in fact, I'm on the Hillside board and we sponsor pattern conferences around the world. Uh, we have one coming up later this year in Portland, Oregon. There's one in Chile, which will be Sugarloaf Plop. I just, a couple months ago, I was at Asian Plop in Japan. Uh, and, and we're really trying to write and document and share knowledge about proven practices. And we, in the patterns community, we always talked about, well, the solution to a problem within a context as we're writing patterns, and what's the trade-offs and forces that we do. And I, I kind of grew up from the software architect group at the University of Illinois in the early days, and I worked with um, one of the gang of four guys, Ralph Johnson, it, it, there, and that's who I did my graduate work with. So I was highly influenced from the early days from that mindset, as well as what makes good design, good architecture, and that's what we were looking at, reusable designs, frameworks, and stuff. But patterns are really focused around this. Though I kind of changed, I had this other one because sometimes, imagine if you're an interface designer, you don't look at solving a problem as designing a cool interface. You look at that as artistic. Like if you want to make a cool new uh, painting, it's not solving a problem. <laughs> so a pattern can also be proven practices to repeating situations. 
You know, uh, I, I'm trying to do a new design. And what are some good practices that I do? Like one friend of mine, Dick Gabriel, that I showed you, uh, the guitarist, also is a poet. He's a computer scientist as well, but he's a poet. He writes a poem a day. And he says he, he writes a lot of terrible ones. <laughs> but that practice, um, to, to re and, and he uses a lot of things to help him get creative. Sometimes he'll take some sentences, translate it to many languages all the way around, and come back to what does the in translation end up with. And, and then sometimes that'll trigger some time of creativity type thing. So there's some practices to kind of help you do some to, 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 uh, that. And patterns in general embody what works, but also what doesn't work in the trade-offs. It is really capturing, if, if you're a guru at something and you're really good and the gurus, if you were able to capture that knowledge and I'm talking to you, I'll find some, hopefully some best practices and we're trying to document that. And, and in general, then it's about quality. We always say quan, the quality without a name. I always related it to like, I don't know if anybody heard of the book, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. I read as a kid, but he was looking, searching for quality, you know, and quality without a name. But in a sense, a lot of the patterns movement was trying to find these quality attributes. And we're trying to build, you know, what are certain, if we want certain qualities, we want security within a system. What are some of the patterns of techniques that we can do to help ensure a certain level of security with that? There, there may be trade-offs and there's different patterns you would use. And I used to say best practices, but then people always debate what's best. <laughs> so rather than best, they're proven practices, good practices for this. So let's get into our patterns. So before the first sprint, what do we got to do? So in our patterns, it starts out before the first sprint. What, what we like to talk about is we want to really climb on the shoulders of giants. In other words, there might be some reference architecture that we can build upon. Maybe it's a green project we're starting. Should we be using .NET? So uh, maybe we're going to use microservices. Are there some different frameworks we should think about? Maybe we have past projects with some different architectural decisions that we learned from that fed into this, and we already have how our persistent layer should be and, and how things should be on that. Uh, you know, what, what database technology? So really, when we're cli climbing on the shoulder of giants, we're trying to really kind of from this, we're making decisions and we're, and this might influence our roadmap. Some decisions we can't, we don't, we're not ready to make now, but we know we have to make them. So we put on our roadmap that after a few sprints, we need to decide on the security framework and maybe we need to do some architectural spikes to do some experiments and get some feedback. And so we start off with climbing on the shoulder of giants and let's learn by what we've done before. Okay? So then as we go through, after we climb on the shoulder of giants, so maybe we're, we've made some decisions. We're gonna, we're gonna start off uh, with at least these few reference architectures. These others we're not sure about, we're gonna experiment. They're on the roadmap. Maybe we start an architectural spike over the next couple of weeks, you research this, you research that, we'll come back. But anyway, we're making some decisions, but now, no matter what decisions we make, there's gonna be some areas that, are, that the frameworks won't quite solve for us. There's still going to be some painful areas. It's not going to be a silver bullet. We just buy this one framework and instantly every, all the security, reliability, everything is taken care of. There's still going to be some potential painful things. So we need to find where it hurts to focus on these difficult areas. So we want to find the things in the reference that don't work well. So for example, uh, maybe we're using some JDEE type uh, role base access, and, but we need something more powerful than that. Maybe uh, that's not good enough. And so even though we've made decisions from this, uh, we're going to use th these set of components, this, this reference architecture. We need to put a little bit of work in these other areas on that. And so how, how can we evolve and w what more do we need on top of some of the early decisions that, that we can make? Now when we're making the early decisions, it's important if we're going to be agile about architecture, is not to overthink it. Get some feedback, put it on the road, delay what we can, as long as we can, but don't delay too much. It's trying to find that balance in, in that. And so, and so based upon that, as we're finding where it hurts, we might need to think about when should we delay to? When can, you know, when is a responsible moment? When I hear people talk about the last, or last responsible moment, Unfortunately, it almost always gets translated 
to people I work with in industry, the last possible moment. <laughs> oh, it's not, hey, don't worry, we, we can add security in and, and we can, uh, you know, scale it a little bit, you know, a couple, a few weeks before, a few months before. Well, yes, it, sometimes you can still do it and get it out there, but that has a lot of ramifications. That can really have a tendency to tear your system up and cause a lot of potential ugly spaghetti code, uh, uh, you know, muddy things up where you didn't want it. And if you'd made that decision a little bit earlier, it, if, if we would have communicated that well within the teams that this is an important consideration and this is where we have enough here to think about it. So we want to really plan on when we should make these decisions. So we need to put on our roadmap when should we think about these things? If performance may be a problem, because we know we're going to have to scale up to millions of users, even though we're starting off with tens of thousands of users, maybe we should think of, uh, put on the roadmap, where should we consider that? That's more the agile way. And as we learn, we should constantly be updating our roadmap as we go. So me and Rebecca Wurzbrock, we actually wrote up some patterns on being agile at quality where we called it is choose the most responsible moment rather than the last responsible because the last responsible sometimes gets thought of as the last possible. <laughs> and, and even though you're still able to hack it in somehow or find some ways to make it work, it can cause a lot of ramifications. So some decisions are so important, we don't want to wait till the last responsible. We want, there might be a more responsible one that, that we can start looking at this. So we, we can start planning where in the backlog should we start having activities? Where, where on the roadmap should we even start considering it? And thinking, does it add value now? And can we start uh, doing some experiments with it? Um, and in fact, one thing I like, uh, you might get it out, still doing it at the last, but the quality might be very low and affect how agile and how fast we can move later. And uh, so I even kind of relate this to Postel's law in a way, you know, I, I'm conservative in what I do, but liberal in what I accept from others kind of in a sense. And so same way with these, with these responsible moments uh, with this as well. So, so as we're doing our roadmap, I think it's good to actually think about when, when should we have certain things on the roadmap. Uh, if, if we know we, that we're going to have to scale and doing, uh, we're going to have to move to the cloud because what we currently have it does, isn't going to quite scale up with our current set of uh, infrastructure and servers that we have. And, uh, and, it, and it'll pay off to go to the, to the cloud. We might think of where do we need to do the cloud research? Where, where should we start thinking about this? Um, maybe there's some, uh, we want to go to mobile and we need to look at certain security issues with the mobile. Uh, you know, we're not in the mobile world yet, but we know that's coming. That's one of our visions on our roadmap. Where should we really think about mobile security? Um, I can't, uh, this is a fake roadmap I put together. I can't really, uh, since I have NDAs with most clients, I can't really share you kind of real roadmap. But you kind of get an idea is it's okay to put certain architectural decisions. Most agile teams in, in general, that sometimes when they first learn agile company, they forget about certain important qualities in, in architectural decisions on the roadmap. And so, so if, if we're going to, uh, as we're being agile around architecture, it is okay, yes we can, include architectural things. And even if you don't have an architectural group, you know, that like what was shared a little bit earlier at the panel I was at, I think the architectural guild idea is, is good, or lead team members, because even when I go into organizations, and even if they don't have somebody they call the architecture role, I can say, you're the architect, you're the architect, because I, 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 even though they're not by the role, because the company doesn't have the role, you see who the lead people who understand the big vision and help make sure things work out. So there still is architectural uh, responsibilities happening, even if it's not with, you have the role for, from the architect. So it's important to still kind of keep that vision and put these things on your roadmap as you go. But, but, but then even as you go through that, uh, you still have to think about, in the architecture, you might think about, well, how, will this framework work good enough? I'm planning for responsible moments. Uh, we might need to do some experiments. We might need to validate some of our decisions that we're making. And, and so we have this thing, uh, this pattern that we call 
tracer bullets. And what tracer bullets is, is it's a little bit, it's similar to a spike solution, but it's not a spike solution, okay? And I'll just kind of give you the, uh, with the tracer bullet, what we're trying to do is, is we're really trying to help guide the choice to define your lower level architecture decisions. And you can think about it, this is, you know, back from, uh, from some game trying to get things right. But you can think about, we want to make sure our architecture is going to work properly. Is it going to get us the security we need? Is it going to, you know, and so a spike solution, sometimes you go off, and this is maybe kind of a special case of a spike solution, but with a spike solution, you go off and you're implementing something and experimenting and bringing it back. Uh, the difference with, with some of these tracer bullets is you, since you're making architectural decision, you may have to do a, a, a more involved implementation than a normal spike solution to really validate. You might have to build a, a little baby system, but end to end showing how it's going to work with this to validate that this, will this actual work for the features that we need or the types of things and does it provide the, uh, the, the types of decisions that we need like performance reliability. Um, so it, it, this is where spikes usually just have one part. The tracer is a complete path with this. And so it's really uh, more of a specific kind of a spike is how I look at it. Okay, so now as we're going through uh, with tracer bullets, Oh, I love the fact that Rebecca had this in her talk yesterday. <laughs> she, she just set the stage for me. Because as we're going through, if we really want to validate the architecture, let's make some architectural decisions early on as we're going through this, is how can we validate this? Even if it's not a framework, even if it's how the team's going to go through and come to a, a gilded uh, decision, a decision by the guild on, these are the way, common, consistent ways that we want to validate and test our architecture, test our system as we go through. And so uh, sometimes that might be making decisions about the framework with, 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 with what you want to do with that. And, and, and the tracer bullets might be ways that we validate. In fact, it, it may go both ways. The tracer bullets can validate the test architecture, and the test architecture can be used to validate some of the decisions that other decisions we're making with the tracer bullets as well. So, we really want to mirror how we want to be able to test and validate our architecture. We, and we want to make some of this decision early because we want to start building testing and automating in as much as possible, as soon as possible. We, we don't over-design with it, but we try to make informed decisions as early as possible with this. Um, like, you might think of, uh, so you're making a... Uh, you, you might need to formalize your approach. Are, are, are we going to have a database on the uh, per microservices on our architecture? And, and how are we going to validate that? And we're going to clone databases and clean it out? Uh, uh, things like that. Or maybe we have a copy of, uh, uh, of the, the uh, you know, a mangled version of, of the actual production database. And we're able to provide some testing on that with some predefined things. Um, now, up to now, I will note, these are all the patterns you think uh, as being agile about architecture of things that you do ahead of time or before you really get into too many sprints. But that doesn't mean that's the only time you do them. You can come back to these set of patterns any time you have to, you're being agile and now we learn something new and we need to evolve our architecture, we can come back and, and reapply some of these patterns. And, and so even though uh, I've kind of presented these before doing a sprint, the, 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 they should be readdressed at any point in time. Okay, so do these patterns kind of make sense to people? Have people seen and used some of these ideas before? Anybody? You have, maybe? Which one have you used before, or a few of them? Well, I, I'm, I'm struggling to understand like, how this differs from you know, spinning up the POC. So I was seeing that similar. Yeah, yeah. And, and it could be something something similar with that. Are, are, are there things that you think before you kind of get into your regular sprints, are there some important considerations that maybe we've missed, even if it be an ad? Maybe there's some patterns we because uh, we're still open for, you know, as we're evolving our pattern language, maybe there's some things that we've missed. 
And so people, if, you, if you think of something, definitely let me know. Is, uh, is we're trying to document and share. That's what patterns are all about. Let's, it's, it, let's help share and help uplift the community and help learn from each other. So now let's think about during the sprint. I've given you a few ideas to think before your sprints, and you can always readdress this at any time during the evolution of your software system. Maybe after a few years, you need to re-evolve and rethink persistence, or, or now we're going to go to microservices, and you can still do these things. But what about during the project? So let's look at what we might be looking at during the project. So here we've planned for responsible moments, but, to, but it, it's important to include architectural decisions in the backlog. If it's really, it's supposed to, Agile's supposed to be a collaborative team, all of us working together, not the PO being some kind of like master that knows everything. If, if your role is architect, you, it should be collaborating, the PO should be collaborating closely with you because there's important decisions the PO makes that can influence what happens to the architecture. And sometimes it's important to put architectural decisions in that backlog. Um, so yes, we can do that. We can, uh, maybe we're gonna add access control is one of the things. And that's gonna go cross a lot of components, possibly cross a lot of features. Uh, so, you know, like performance. Performance uh, might have to influence a lot of different stories. Um, oh, boy, that would be nice. We can eliminate all technical debt in the done. <laughs> Woohoo! Yeah, I wish, but you know, maybe there's certain technical debt that we can eliminate. So you can add uh, backlog items for these quality related architectures and, 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 and it provides a lot of value. Um, usually I prefer these to be in a single backlog, but sometimes the bureaucracy of a company or an organization doesn't allow that. The PO only wants features. So you, the teams, or if there is ar architects within your organization, or if you have an architect guild, or, or lead team engineers, whatever it may be, they may have to keep their separate backlog. <laughs> uh, I prefer uh, you know, not to have to do that, because that means you have a better relationship with the PO, and well, they see the, the value, and you don't have to try to explain it. But if not, if, if the politics or whatever doesn't allow for that, you can put these into a, a separate uh, backlog. Okay, so an another thing is what, I'm call what we call architectural triggers. So it could be as we're going along, our architectural decisions were good for the time, but we might have triggers that if certain things happen within a system, we might want to note that maybe we need to readdress the architecture or make some decisions. So it could be that for, for the way our business is going and the architectural decisions we made three or four years ago were the perfect, the, the, the best we could do given the people we had, the business we were going and our prediction, but wow, we were far more successful than we ever imagined. All of a sudden, we took way off and, and so it might be useful to, to be noted that man, whoa, we're still okay, but boy, performance is getting, becoming a serious problem. We better start including some decisions about performance over the next few sprints. We better, maybe we need to create a sub team or a couple people or a little guild to kind of look at performance. Uh, maybe we need to hire in a performance expert just to help us analyze what's going on for, you know, bring somebody in for a few days or a few weeks or whatever with this. So it's not that we, we don't wait until it's bad, but early on we might say, well, what are some important triggers that should notify us that there's some issues that we need to start looking at before we're putting the fire out. So th this is it, so it's okay if you're being agile to still think ahead. You don't have to do a lobotomy, and <laughs> it's still okay to think. And I think that sometimes when in the agile community people think, "Oh, just don't don't worry about. It. We'll just wait till we get there, and we'll magically deal with it." But I've seen a lot of issues that happen if if you don't think about certain things. So it is okay to think about that. Uh, so the quality target, maybe it's still being met, but it's getting bad, and it might have broad system impact. If this happens, it would really harm our business badly. So maybe we put some triggers to watch as it's, it's you know, it's still okay, but boy, it's going the wrong direction. 
And so how can we pre prevent that? And, and, and how can we take some remedy actions on that? So also, as we're putting architecture, in the, like you might occasionally do some spikes. And this is different than like your normal uh, spike solution. Uh, it's an architectural spike where we might need to go off and do some experiments as we're going through and get some feedback. So you can include, as we're planning on responsible moments, after we have enough infrastructure there, that's when we want to go off and do the spike. Should we try this way for handling security or that way? Maybe we have a couple teams do a little experiment, come back. Maybe it's a mix of the two, or we decide not to do that way and go some new way because we learned something. The main thing is to time box it. Uh, it should never be more than, generally you like to do some, something within a, a half day or so, but sometimes you might take a few days to do some uh, experiments. Sometimes it might take longer depending on what, what we're looking at. But, but you mostly you time box it, you try to learn and adapt. And so ultimately these spikes might add tasks in the backlog for certain members to do things in there. So you, uh, some architectural tasks. Uh, so, so this spike, might be uh, some investigation with some new alternatives. Maybe there's, we're trying to do some analysis. Should we go, are we really ready for microservices? Does that pay off? Or maybe the monolith is better right now. Let's stay with the monolith. Monolith is not a bad architectural style if you do it properly. Uh, microservices, uh, as Chris Richardson gave a talk last year at, at the keynote here for Saturn, he talked about sometimes a monolith is the exact right way to go, and he showed why that is. There's a lot of cost with microservices. Just because it's the buzzword shouldn't mean we should go off and do it. <laughs> you know, now we have a big distributed system problem, <laughs> and there's trade-offs and costs with that as well. So when we're doing these architectural spikes, we're, we're, it's, it's not as tactical as these XP-like design spikes. And they need to be very visible within the company. This is back to transparency, which is a good agile principle in practice. And, and it's bounded in time. And we're learning something, and then we make decisions off that. And ultimately, what we do is we get down to where we, we still have to deal with technical debt. <laughs> so I've heard quite a few talks here Technical debt's obviously becoming very popular over the past couple of years, and there's a lot of people writing books or doing workshops, but obviously we know if we don't manage te technical debt in itself is not good or bad. It, 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 it's, there's trade-offs. Where the bad problem happens is, so sometimes de a debt helped me buy a house. When I was a student, it helped me get an education. You know, but if bad debt, as the U.S. learned with banks too big to fail, that's when problems can actually, you know, serious consequences can happen. Uh, if you don't pay back the debt in certain areas, you know, and so, same way in our systems, if we let our systems get so bad, we can no longer uh, support our business with it or, or we can't grow as fast as we'd like to. And so we need to deal with that. And so, it's, and there's trade-offs, and it's, it's important to manage that. The technical debt is a term coined by Ward Cunningham back in the 90s, and it was really, he was really talking about um, the consequences of certain debt. And whenever we make decisions, this is like cooking, we're gonna dirty stuff up, but if we don't, if we let the kitchen get too bad, we won't be able to cook in our kitchen anymore. We have no clean pans or pots, and everything's piled up, and we can't find our knives, and, there are, and even if we did find it, it's not ready to use. Uh, and so some, some things we, we, we have to deal with, and, and there's consequences. And in fact, I've even heard within technical debt, because usually that's looked at code, complexity, long methods, many parameters, whatever, and yeah, that's technical debt, you know, a lot of entanglements, but you also might have quality debt, certain qualities or architectural. We, we use frameworks that were very legitimate five years ago, but now the industry's changed so much, it's not like before when we could have waited 10 years, now it's changing so fast that <laughs> we, we need to maybe evolve and, and no longer use this framework. How can we swap it out? Um, maybe there's test debt. We, haven't, we don't have good enough testing going on in our system. And, and so how can we manage this and, and um, put it on our backlog and prioritize? And in fact, it should be put on the backlog and prioritized and maybe even included uh, as part of the roadmap on certain times and, and ways of looking at it where you can really make decisions uh, where, where it adds value. Uh, I went to a a talk er earlier, um, and it was focusing on, uh, 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 man it was by Michael Keeling, and he was talking about managing technical debt earlier today, and, uh, and this is some work by, done, done by Grazielli 
um, down in Brazil, and she actually just finished PhD, but she did a lot. Of, she went out into industry and did a lot of work and managing it. And and something that that she really did a lot of good work with with this is is focusing on not only what caused it, because we, if we see that we have bad practices, so we're always creating debt. Maybe we need to change our practice, and we can learn. Because ignorance is, is bliss in a way, but ignorance won't fix anything. I need to look at, if I'm not aware, if I'm trying to lose weight, and I'm not, which I probably need to, right? And I'm not as lean and agile as I used to be as a young guy. So if I, I need to be monitoring and looking, how many steps am I taking? Is, is my diet, how's that working? Uh, am I actually losing weight? How much do I weigh? Uh, but I might want to look at the causes, things that trigger me to <laughs> maybe not follow through as well. But then I, once I identify it, then we have to look at the impact on the business. And one thing I really like about her work, and, and even Michael was talking about this, where does it add value? Some debt is okay if it's not hurting you. If, you, if that code never changes, yeah, it's not the way, it's ugly. Oh, I sure don't want my friends to look at what I did there. But it works, and nobody touches it. Why well, fix it? You know, if it works, why fix it kind of thing. Whereas if the code is changing a lot and it's difficult to change, or maybe the frameworks are causing a problem and some architectural decisions, we need to do some architectural refactoring. We can look at where does it make business sense and does it pay to do this? Then we can prioritize it and include it on the backlog and maybe even on the roadmap. And that's where visibility is important. Make things visible so that we know what's going on and we can see, including technical debt. Uh, you know, so uh, not the running system, these may have architectural triggers, but we can include it on the backlog, but we might also have, we, I want to see that this entanglement's starting to happen, or this performance is starting to become an issue. And visibility is really key to a lot of these patterns. And so to really detect, and these patterns are not a part of our original Continuous inspection was not part of the original stuff I did with Rebecca and Eduardo, but we call it continuous inspection. And Paulo Merson, who is one of the chairs here, uh, he's done a lot of excellent work in this area, continuous inspection. He's given a lot of really good talks and workshops and tutorials on this. And I, I wrote a paper with, with, with him and a friend of mine, Adamar Aguiar from Portugal and, and Eduardo Guerra as well from Brazil on this continuous inspection, and that's, that's where you make things visible. And you can do a lot of work for as you're uh, making things visible. Uh, it, you, really what we're trying to do is, it might be on running software, it might be doing statical analysis of some source code, it, it might be getting some operational data, and we're doing some analysis, we're giving the feedback, not only to developers, possibly as they're checking in and writing code or things like that, but you might also be giving it if you have architects or an architect guild or, t but it should be almost anybody, even the PO should, I mean, if we're gonna be transparent, let, let's put all this out there. Is there technical debt building up? How's the system working? So we can get some kind of this continuous inspection and, and start building this in. Uh, in not, not only in uh, some of the problems with, within the system, such as some code smell detections or test coverage or, you know, uh, entanglements, uh, technical debt sizes, but you might do architectural checks, uh, application security, architectural conformance. Maybe we, we don't want to have SQL injection, so we have a front, we always should go through the persistent layer because it's, we put a lot of work to help prevent SQL injection. So if people write to the database, maybe we can check is, maybe they don't know that there's this framework, and so we can even use it as education, but hey, uh, do you know that maybe you should be using this to prevent, protect from SQL injection? Or if there was a problem using this framework, maybe we need to fix it. <laughs> maybe we need to know why did you need to go uh, around the architecture to, to kind of cheat to go through here. Maybe we have something that we need to learn from this. So this might even be going to the business people, POs, anybody. And it's important to automate as much as possible as you go and as soon as possible. Um, I actually like that quote by Bill Gates. I remember when he was called the chief architect of Microsoft, right? 20 some year, about 20 years ago or whatever. Uh, and he said, the first rule of any technology used in a business is that automation applied to an efficient operation will magnify the efficiency. The second is that automation applied to an inefficient operation will magnify the inefficiency. 
So by automating things, we can, and, it, and so it's important to automate as much as possible, and that's what I really like about some of the DevOps and other things going on, is there are certain things that we can automate that, uh, originally when we wrote, we wrote this pattern, me and Rebecca wrote this pattern as being agile at quality, but we originally called it automate first, but you really don't automate first, but it was really trying to be provoking <laughs> to try to challenge you from that, like a, uh, a Kent Beck out there or, or Bob Martin, you're not doing TDE because you didn't write your test first or whatever. But really it's automate anything that's hard, repetitive, involves waiting or error prone, uh, and things like quality metrics or code smell or architectural conformance that uh, automate this as soon as possible what you can because it can be very hard to automate later and if you start building that mindset in that this is difficult, it can save you a lot of cycles make you more lean so you can do more and have more experimental time, and it can help you validate as you go. Okay? So I've kind of given you the second set of patterns now and threw in a couple more for free, like the automate as you go and the continuous inspection. So what I want to do is, because I think it's, it's easy for me to sit up here and share ideas and experiences that I have and share good stories, which I think is good, but I, I know all of you have really good stories as well and experiences. So I want to break into some groups of about four or five people each. So it looks like we have room in here to have three or four groups. And take what you wrote down as an architect. So pick at least not, you don't have to do it for every one, but pick one or two of your problems that you have. And it would be kind of cool as if we, t I want to time box it. It would be cool as if you look at some of these patterns I've given you, including the automation. I didn't know where to put automation. It kind of cross cuts through some of these, so I couldn't put the, the automation. But what, what are some of the, uh, I want to take about 10 minutes per group, and how could some of these patterns possibly have helped you with some of the architectural problems? So as we're being agile at quality from, maybe there were some things you could do here or there, and then come back and we'll share together and then I'll, I'll do some closing stuff, okay? Is that fairly clear? And I'm a big believer in the agile self-organization stuff, so I'll let you guys decide on the teams. But generally, I think about four or five, and a, a good suggestion I always like to say, even though obviously since you're self-organized, it doesn't matter, but if we work together all the time, it's good if we split up because we already talk together and then I can learn new ideas from new people I've never talked with before. So, but. Uh, of course, I'm not going to enforce that. It's just a good suggestion I've learned. When I was with Ralph Johnson and we used to go to conferences, he used to have this rule that he would push for us is don't hang around together too much. You guys already know each other, so go talk to new people and learn new things. So anyway, let's take 10 minutes to do that, okay? So I heard a lot of really great, interesting discussions, and I even hate to break it up because... I know that we could probably talk about this for <laughs> quite a bit of time, and there's a lot of good stories being shared, but for the sake of time, and in case you guys want to go to the comedy thing, I want to at least let's come back together. But what I'd like to do is at least take a few minutes, because you guys had all had such good discussions, is if each team could pick like a spokesperson, and we'll, we'll go, each one take just a few minutes to share some of the patterns they did, and even if there's some other patterns that I don't have that maybe you shared about as well, uh, I welcome that as well. So who would like to go first? Okay, well, we, we had lots of great ideas from everybody here, so, um, but we're going to choose one that I think uh, probably incorporates the majority of everything that you see on the, so, oh, well, yep, yeah. so uh, uh, one of the members of the team here talked about a project where they're trying to take credit card data information, move it into more of a secure network, and anybody who's ever worked with credit card information, there's PCI compliance on it, you got to keep it safe and protected, if you don't, there's all kinds of other things you have to worry about. But sometimes trying to convince the customers, the business, uh, and to why it's important, it's a little bit harder. So we talked about climbing on the shoulder of the giants. Well, I'm six foot five, so you know, put them on my shoulders so they could see the over, uh, 
the, the holistic view of what's, why it's important. Uh, maybe they don't quite see that at the moment and why they have to spend this X amount of, amount of money to put this particular credit card data into a secure network, but maybe if you help them see that, they understand why it's important. Then jumping into finding where it hurts. So, so the, kind of about tossing out the tracer bullets. So also being a private service military, you get to see where those bullets land. And uh, to think about this is if you're thinking about credit card data and you see a, a place where maybe the, where the network's not as secure, uh, then you know what, this is what you need to fix and this is how you're gonna fix it. And um, that's where it comes up, planning for responsible moments. And where we talked about going down to the architectural spike or a, a proof of concept, to be able to put that in the, into our secure network, so. And then eventually, hopefully, understand the imp importance of it and then continuously inspecting it and making sure that we actually remove that, that mound where we're finding where that tracer bullet hits and, and, uh, and testing that, that, that whole overall process. So. Apologize for putting you guys on the spot. I'll just walk over here. Okay. All right. I mean, we talked about a couple of things, but I, I think one of the things we did talk about is relating an experience where, um, where we had um, a lot of uh, hardware, uh, unique hardware dependencies and some operating dependencies, and at some point under a, a product uh, buildup, we, we had done an architectural spike where we implemented a, a layered style architecture for those things and implemented it for just some parts of the system. Program was canceled, but we used it as the starting point for the next program. And then we, then we got cut short on the next discussion, so <laughs> not enough time. <laughs> So yeah, uh, we had uh, some interesting problems. One of them uh, was a tech stack that was based on a monolith um, that uh, had a lot of technical debt and uh, also they want to kind of slice it up, uh, potentially microservice, uh, like move to microservices, um, but unfortunately, the uh, organization isn't currently uh, really agile, so they don't have a backlog to introduce things like um, architecture uh, tickets and um, tech debt tickets and that kind of thing. So uh, those were like pretty obvious, like if you can get there, ways to improve that. Um, but the other kind of patterns are uh, the find where it hurts and like really focus on like the biggest pain points first. Um, yeah, uh, and then did you want to share some of the struggles you, you had and we talked about? Sure, most of our um, struggles in the past have been around the feedback loop between architecture and development mm -hmm. and um, not having our architecture in our backlog and not having a, um, sometimes not necessarily having a buy-in from development about the architecture and uh, allowing, I suppose, allowing our uh, development to make what are essentially architectural changes without feeding back into the, the original architecture to, to keep things current so that in the future, when you go to make a change, you, you know exactly what you're, from, from the architecture documents, you can pull those and, and see exactly where you're starting from. Um, and know where you need to so go. That might even be a different pattern that we don't even have that we have written out. Is some form some kind of feedback loop for, for, for doing some of that. Very good. Very, very good discussions. And this is the first time I've actually ran this exercise. So thank you for being my experiment, my spike solution, my uh, feedback loop on this. And, and I'm definitely looking uh, for more feedback. So, so I, I was definitely uh, very pleased with uh, some of the results. I mean. Ultimately, as we're trying to be agile about architecture, we're torn between having a sustainable design and an architecture that can sustain the delivery and keep us going and add value to our business, but still keep evolving quickly and be agile and lean and have our business be able to still quickly adapt to the fast, the quickly changing business environment. And so it's good to, just for some additional things, is as we're going through this, it's good to do the continuous improvement type cycle with even architectural quality is, uh, we, we can include this in some of our planning and as we implement, but we need that feedback loop 
And, and just like, as you just pointed out, getting that feedback, because it might influence the architecture as we go. And now we learned that they weren't able to quite do some things that we had envisioned. We, we can do that. And so it's good to, uh, to kind of build in. And you can build tests in as you go as part of that. And um, to, to kind of validate things, you want to test early. But something that's key to really improving this, and I think gets missed way too much in the Agile community, is what I call pause points, time to think, time to experiment, time to uh, do this. So, and, and in fact, I wrote this up as a slack time pattern. You really, and, and, and even Spotify does this a lot. If you look at Spotify when they were thinking about, you know, think it, build it, tweak it, ship it, but sometimes you have to rethink it <laughs> and we have to experiment. But what happens a lot of times in a lot of Agile so-called agile people is, you know, here you have, we're trying to get our velocity high, and maybe we find some ways to reduce waste. So we're able to make these tasks a little bit shorter. The issue I see a lot of times is rather than use that time to help validate the architecture, uh, make sure you have better qualities going in and experiment, maybe we can find an order of magnitude better way of doing everything. They just shift left all these other tasks. Ooh, now we can get more done. And in the short term, that looks good, but then maybe, it, you know, by experimenting, we can innovate and find a much better way of even doing what we're doing now. And if we really want to improve, we need to do that and monitor. So reducing waste can help, but sometimes if, we're not, if we don't have slack, we have to inject it. Maybe you do it with retrospectives or, or you have some dojos <laughs> type ideas. Maybe we're going to do some architectural spikes might be a way. Uh, uh, so, so there's some different ways you can inject things in that. I know that uh, with one organization I was working with, one team, what they did is all the team members came up and before they did their daily stand-up, they're all waiting to get there and have a coffee and not, you know, and the stand-up's going to happen later, is they start off their day looking, was there any technical debt from last night that we had to deal with and do a little bit of cleanup? And it's almost like doing your morning stretches before you run or something, is it'll sustain you better, or, or meditation or whatever before they go. And, and it, it was a way of injecting a little bit of slack time at the beginning of it, and it really helped them perform much better all through the day. They got more done, and it helped their mindset. They couldn't do this at the end of the day because everybody's frantic, calls are happening, maybe they have to go home and have dinner, or there's something with the kids coming up. Uh, so, but it was kind of a cool way of starting off the day. And then if you can take the slack time and make good use out of it, it's not meant just to be busy work or wasteful work. Sometimes you need to just set, step back and clear your mind and rethink it. But sometimes you want to try little experiments. And in fact, Tom DeMarco has a nice book on Slack. And, you know, and, and um, the most important thing about learning from Slack, getting past burnout, busy work, and the myth is uh, the innovation. And full, being full all the time, stressed out, is never should be the goal. Because if something happens, it's almost like when I, I just flew home from Portugal last Saturday. And my amount of time between my connection in Frankfurt was exactly one hour. And I need everything to go just perfect to make my connection to Philadelphia to get back through Chicago. Well, that didn't happen. <laughs> you know, they landed on time, but by the time I had to get on the bus, and then I couldn't get my ticket printed ahead of time. I had to wait till I got in Frankfurt before they would issue me my ticket. So obviously I, met, I didn't have enough slack to do all that, you know, and, and impediments come in the way. And if I had a perfect scenario and everything was just perfect, I could have made it. But as it was, I ended up getting rerouted through Dallas. It still worked out okay, but I had to go through some, some other things. And so if something goes wrong and we don't allow a little bit of slack, we'd, we'd have no room for correcting or trying to fix things. And that's where slack can make a huge difference as well. And I always relate it to uh, Daniel Cunningham. He does this really thinking fast and slow. Uh, this is a really good book, but it talks about there's value in both. But most Agilists just get caught up with the fast, red, green, red, green, red, green. <laughs> well, wait, you're supposed to, sometimes we need to rethink there's a better way. And don't forget refactor, red, green, refactor, <laughs> right? And uh, so I, would, I, I, I could highly recommend Mindy's uh, for people to think about. And, and also there's some things that we can uh, include on checklists can help us sometimes uh, put a little bit of slack time in with what we're doing as well. So here's one from James Thorpe. Um, he shared us his company's checklist, but he had checklists. They even had architectural items that they would check, as well as certain code quality items. But like 
Uh, for example, no web data services have been created or modified without full documentation, architectural sign-off. Because there are some things that were so important they felt that they needed it before they released, and this caused, you know, helped to give them a little bit of validity of what's going on. Performance, you know, they had some performance checks and other things before they released. And so, as you're being agile about quality, one thing, if you have an architectural role, and even if you don't, somebody's still the kind of, the, you're still doing architectural practices and you have a team lead or some engineer, some, there's still some architectural practices going on. And it's, it's important that with some of these quality concerns and might even be QA with some, the lead team people, uh, architects should still work closely with the product owner and there should be this collaborative effort and, and uh, an understanding of the, the big visions. So if you do have an, uh, the architectural roles, wh whoever is, whether you have a formal architect or not, when, when you're looking at from, from agile to traditional, even though there's still some governance you have to do, it seems like architectural, from an agile perspective, it's more towards sustainable development, even though there might still be some governance, whereas in traditional, it was more towards governance. And rather than a planned architecture, this is more like the evolutionary architecture that Rebecca was talking about. So we know that we're going to have to change. We're not going to try to, we'll design some things up front, but we won't design too much and we'll delay what we can, architectural decisions, as long as we can, knowing we need to evolve the architecture. And rather than be an independent in an ivory tower, it might happen that you become more integrated with the development teams. Even QA, sometimes I've seen organizations, as they become more agile, QA is still there, but now they're integrated with, throughout the teams. You know, and even some of the architectural concerns, uh, could, could, working more on good practices and risk mitigation, uh, they, they might help with the overall vision, whereas before, in traditional, there was maybe more focus put there. So, a lot depends how much architecture risk do you have makes decision, uh, will influence where you go with this. You know, are you evolving a new product? Uh, is this more or less just a, uh, are we writing a space mission to Mars? You know, we're writing some uh, system for that and there's uh, lives at stake. Or maybe it's an online ordering and there's a lot of money or maybe it's just a, a, a online support system and so if something occasionally bad happens, even though we don't want it to happen, it, it's, it's not as, catastrophic as, as from some other things. Um, so the, you know, the more risk you have, the more attention, obviously, we need to pay to the architecture. And so I, I usually look at it, depends on how big you are. So small teams, if we do a lean startup, and, and, and usually companies are trying to mimic lean startups, but usually they do that with an incubator model, is how I've seen successfully done. They'll bring out and try to, that way they can isolate them from the corporate politics and other stuff that's going on. But if you have, you know, just, uh, you know, about 10 people or less and it's non-credit, life critical, known domain or whatever, usually you can, the architecture can evolve and the team itself is responsible for that architecture. They're the, with that. But, but if you really get into a very large project, you still need some visionaries, whether it's a guild or whatever that goes across all of this. And um, so... This emerging architecture is going to reflect, it's like Conway's law with the organization structure here, but there's still a lot of significant risk challenges and you need a lot of coordination between the teams. So it's important that the architecture needs more attention, whether you do it with a team of architects or whether the architectural roles are being worked out through engineers throughout the team, but somebody needs to pay attention to this. So agile values can drive, it's not like Agile and architecture should be completely separate. You can see, Agile does not say you can't have good architecture or can't think. Agile practices can drive it because Agile is really do something, prove it, validate it, get feedback, learn, do what adds the most value. That's more the Agile mindset, the Agile thinking. So reduce, reduce, make it testable, prototype, experiment, you know, and, and so if we're being Agile about architecture, we can do all these things and incrementally refining it, defer any decisions that we can as long as we can. So in summary, I presented these patterns for evolving agile architecture. I started out with this batch that gave you some things to do ahead of time. We have more details written and some papers I have online and of course you can either email me or send me a message and I'll give you uh, direct access to all these patterns we've written. 
which have some uh, real world experiences in them. Then I also included you some patterns for you, things to do even as, you, uh, as you're going through your sprints. And you can always go back to the others. And then I finished up with, I, I also added these continuous inspection that I did and wrote up with, with Paulo and Eduardo and Adamar. Uh, uh, how can we keep things visible? And then of course, automate, automate, automate as much as possible when you can. Want to make sure not to forget automate. So being agile, I always like to look at the agile mindset. Agile isn't like blindly just following what somebody says is being at. That, to me, that's being do dogmatic, religious. You only have, if you're not doing exactly like this, you're not being agile. But that sounds rigid. That's almost anti the definition of agile. You know, so if, if you have, um, so I say be agile rather than do agile. Doing agile, you have rules and procedures, very strict skills, one, one truth, knowledge is intellectual. Whereas being agile, you have principles and values. Knowledge is intuitive. You have multiple truths possible, and we're experimenting, and there's trade-offs, just like interesting designs have trade-offs. So, and it's good to do both slow thinking and fast thinking, working together as you're being agile. And you can still do what adds the most value, and you can still do, uh, it's still good, good to do architecture, but you do the right amount, you know? Uh, so it's balancing, be more pragmatic. We don't do a lot of upfront planning. We've kind of left that. Sometimes people call this traditional or waterfall. But no planning. Oh, we're agile. Just don't worry about it. Sometimes I see people call this agile. Don't, don't think about it at all. Or just, and sometimes that's chaos. That, that's a process, but I wouldn't call it agile. Agile, you can still have a plan, but it's a rough adaptive of planning. And we're learning as we go and constantly change. So it's a journey. It takes a lot of deliberate practices. Still a lot of hard work. You know, so I'm, I'm Meta Yoda, so people call me, because my last name's Yoda, so I get called Yoda a lot. But I'm hoping that you like um, what I presented to you. And I'm hoping if at least 10 of you really like it, that you go vote that you like this session. But I'm definitely open for more feedback on this. So, so uh, th thank you very much. There's my contact information. And uh, we may have a couple minutes for questions. I don't know, but thank you. Hey, uh, yeah, thanks for the uh, presentation. Uh, I just had a quick question about uh, architecture in the backlog. And uh, it's pretty common to hear that like tech debt is kind of your rule of thumb is bring about 20% uh, into a given sprint. Uh, like, and of course, it's going to vary by how your team wants to do things. What, what would you say is a rule of thumb in terms of like more architectural specific backlog items? Or do you roll that up as that 20%? You, okay. <laughs> First of all, I'm always leery of numbers, and, I, and, and being a consultant and being out there, and then, like Paulo Merson said a couple times yesterday, it depends, right? <laughs> so it really does depend, and I always, I'm always leery of strict numbers. So for, to give you an example, a very large healthcare company, we had six scrum teams, four in the U.S., one in India, and one in China, and we had two-week sprints doing scrum, and we had to have integration, and one of the rules was we could, you could not check anything in unless you had 85% uh, uh, test coverage. So let me ask you a question. What kind of tests do you think the developers were writing? Ones that always pass. Yeah, so ones that they give you that coverage, right? So not, not really a true test necessarily, but it, it was, I mean, they were tests in a way, at least they were in test methods, but they weren't doing, sometimes they were, I could give you 100% coverage. I would rather have really good tests and low coverage than really high coverage and really bad tests. You know, which one to add more value? So you, and, but you get what you measure. If a developer says he can't check it in without that coverage, well, they'll give you coverage. If that's, so you gotta always watch what, what you use numbers. So I'm always kind of, uh, uh, it, it depends. So there isn't no magic number, I don't believe, but I say your team has to decide what adds value. And if you think that it's important and it adds value and helps you, then it should be added on the backlog, whatever that percentage is. And if you've got a lot of pain, you may have a lot. If you don't have a lot of pain, you may not have a lot. Uh, so kind of a follow-on, I somewhat anticipated that answer. Um, so I wanted to question if like an idea uh, around, rather than to avoid like percentages and numbers, uh, you mentioned the most responsible moment. 
Um, can you, what, what do you think of an idea of assigning a most responsible moment onto an ar architecture backlog item so that you can say, hey, this is like a most responsible le like deadline, we should actually pull this in? Yeah, and I think that should be part of the roadmap, and it might, which might mean at this point on the backlog we should be looking at it. But being agile, it could be that when you get to that responsible moment, now you've learned more, now you might reprioritize it because I heard one organization talk about, well, we learned something and it kind of did a spike you guys were talking about. They didn't rewrite that one system, but they you let that influence all their future decisions and they learned from that and adapted that one system to kind of go from the new, the new architecture that they did. So, so, so yeah, it's good to have that and have that at six months out, we need to be thinking about this or three months or whatever. And, in, and at that point, should we put it on the backlog? But you might say, oh, now it doesn't matter. We, it's not even a problem anymore. Or now it's a very serious problem. Or now we can defer two more months with that. Thank you. OK, thank you. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. If you really liked it, please vote at least 10 of you. Okay. Thank you so much.